So my name is Charles Briggs, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome you to a special event. I'm the co-director of the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine, which is part of ISSI, the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. Uh, co-director Seth Holmes wanted to be here today, but unfortunately at the last minute was, was not able to uh, participate, but sends his greetings. I am asked to tell you that if you have small things that tend to make noise in the middle of a lecture, that you might want to ask them not to do so. So I start by acknowledging that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Cochenio Olone. This land was and continues to be of tremendous importance to the Olone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited from and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with university values of community and diversity, um, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to indigenous peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, as little as it might be, um, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and commitment to hold the university more accountable to the needs of Native American peoples. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you today um, to white to a celebration and a talk about whiteout, how racial capitalism changed the color of opioids in America. And here I have a, a, a copy with the striking cover here. Um, it is sponsored by the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine and the Othering and Belonging Institute and really is put together by both of us, co-sponsored by Ber Berkeley Public Health, who has afforded this, um, grac graciously afforded this conference room. Um, I would like to also draw attention to the work both of uh, Deborah Lustig, um, and of Max van der Rooker, who, who organized this event, and we appreciate it greatly. In a minute, I'm going to turn things over to Denise Hurd, my beloved colleague, a fellow medical anthropologist, professor of public health, and associate director of the Othering and Belonging Institute. She will introduce Helena Hansen, who will speak for around 45 minutes. Uh, then Osagi Obas Obasogi, who is the professor of law and public health, chair of the Health Disparities Cluster of the Othering and Belonging Institute, will moderate the question and answer period. Um, welcome also to those of you there, those of you joining us via Zoom as well. You can use the Q&A feature to pose your questions and we will ask um, those on your behalf. So now, Denise, turn it over to you. Oh, I have one last note uh, as a part of a co-sponsoring as well with the, uh, I would like to announce a co-sponsored event coming up on the 26th of October uh, with the, uh, um, the uh, Center for the Critical Study of the Health of Latinx People. We're bringing Dolores Huerta, this is especially with co-director Clara Montini Briggs, um, to Berkeley to International House, four to seven on October 26th, and also with four, five um, amazing activists, people who worked with Cesar Chavez and continue to be struggling for health and labor rights in the, in the San Joaquin Valley. So welcome and thank you, Denise. Thank you, Charles. Um, we're delighted to, really delighted to have Helena Hansen with us today. She is professor and interim chair of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences at UCLA's David Geffen School of Medicine, as well as interim director of the Simmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, also at UCLA. She brings to those varied roles her training as an anthropologist, as, as a medical anthropologist, and, and an MD, and has received numerous awards for her work, including election to the National Academy of Medicine. Before I get to her latest book, I wanna mention her ethnography, Addicted to Christ, Remaking Men in Puerto Rican Pentecostal Drug Ministries, and the book she co-edited, Structural Competency in Medicine and Mental Health, a Case-Based Approach to Treating the Social Determinants of Health. That book is foundational to the emerging framework of structural competency. Some of you may have heard Professor Hansen's outstanding keynote at our conference on structural competency in 2017. And we are honored to have her here with us today to talk about her recent co-authored book, White Out, How Racial Capitalism Changed the Color of Heroin in America. So welcome so much, uh, Professor Hansen. Thank you. 
Well, <clears throat> it is quite an honor to be standing here <laughs> um, and having been welcomed and introduced by such an esteemed group of people. I actually grew up on the Berkeley campus. I'll just disclose that. I lived here between the ages of four and 18 and never imagined that I would be inside of the building giving a talk at the time. I really have to say this is this is quite something and bringing back a lot of memories. And I so want to thank the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, um, the Berkeley School of Public Health, and the Institute for Othering and Belonging for making this possible. Deborah Lustig, Charles Briggs, Denise Hurd, um, Max Vanderwalker, um, also Osagi, Obasogi, uh, just amazing preparation went into this and um, I, I am very honored. So as you heard, I'm celebrating the publication of a book that was probably a couple decades in the making, certainly one decade in the making. Uh, and I thank Charles Briggs for a little, you know, moment, PR moment uh, with the book, which is not the title of my talk. Um, it's, the book is called White Out, How Racial Capitalism Changed the Color of Opioids in America. And um, the book really, you know, I deliberately use the term racial capitalism in the title because I don't think that that's a term that's very familiar outside of social science circles. I'm well aware that there are some important criticisms and critiques and questionings of racial capitalism as a frame going on here at Berkeley. I was um, treated to a couple of articles, you know, uh, just before coming here, new articles uh, critiquing structural, critiquing racial capitalism. And what I will say about the failure of racial capitalism to be kind of a, a timeless and enduring construct across space and place is that I have found racial capitalism a very important tool to think with. So, you know, theory I think is useful when it helps you to think. And in this case, what it's helped me to do is to take my experiences in many different fronts, watching not only the opioid crisis as it's been referred to evolve over the past three decades, but also watch the field of addiction medicine take shape and become a thing in response. Watching that and trying to understand it uh, the concept of racial capitalism, even if I didn't articulate it that way at the time, really helped me make sense of how profit is, make, is made off of racial hierarchies in this time and place in the U.S. How racial stereotypes, for example, that who's prone to addiction um, and how segmented marketing in racially segregated, segregated landscapes is built um, into the logic of our healthcare institutions and drug policies. And also the way that it ends up harming not only black and brown people, but also white people. So, you know, that's a major thrust of the book is that this is harmful to white Americans. Ultimately, racial capitalism is. So now to the talk. Um, the U.S. is now well into the third decade of the contemporary quote unquote overdose crisis. And it's no longer a crisis of opioids alone. Uh, let me see if I can get to the relevant. Okay, so this is a slide that um, that Joe Friedman, an MD PhD student in social medicine, uh, really should take credit for. He took a na national database of drug overdose deaths and created this graph showing how, as of 2020, actually the death rate among Black Americans overtook that of white Americans for, for overdose death cause. Um, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that Native Americans largely always had a higher overdose death rate than white Americans, but that's something that has been invisibilized in the discourse about the quote unquote white opioid crisis, as it was called decades ago. Um, and what we're seeing is an overdose crisis that, like many other overdose crises in the history of our country, began with legal white medical narcotics and moved into black and brown street markets later as the toxicity of the drug became apparent. So we'll get into a little bit of historical precedent on that count, but this is not the first time that it's happened. And in fact, it's hard to find an example of any drug that is causing deaths in street markets that did not start off as a prescribed narcotic um, with largely white and largely affluent consumers. 
Um, and so as racially targeted drug policies push these toxic substances into marginalized communities, and that's what we're seeing now, uh, and as they're selectively criminalized there, there's often a biomedical response for white affluent communities that stays in place, those with access to doctors. But I think the bottom line of this graph is that the death rates for every racial ethnic group included here are going up. So ultimately it's you know a, a phenomenon that's harming all groups. And I just there are some epidemiologists in the room. And actually, I think I'm probably citing their work in this. So apologies if I get this wrong. Um, but many, many epidemiologists working on overdose identify four waves of overdose crises since the late 1990s. And the first wave was due to prescription opioids. Um, the second, we, and that's the story I'm going to go into in a bit. The second wave due to heroin as prescription drug monitoring programs and temper resistant formulations of prescription opioids made pharmaceutical grade and therefore safer opioids harder to get and to inject and snort. The third wave was due to fentanyl, other high potency synthetic opioids that quickly replaced heroin in street markets as cartels discovered the advantages of a more potent, uh, therefore lightweight and easier to smuggle um, opioid over heroin. And so it quickly became obvious that black and native Americans were disproportionately exposed to fentanyl and sister products. The more socially marginalized consumers of street supplies had and have less control over the contents of their supplies, particularly in the weeks to months after their release from prison or jail, when their risk of relapse is high and their tolerance for opioids very low because they haven't had access to opioids while incarcerated. And then in that moment of being released from prison or jail, that's an incredibly stressful time where people don't have access to social or health services. They've been disqualified from many public benefits, including, including housing because of their record. Um, the fourth and current wave on this slide is poly substance use, as we call it in addiction medicine. That includes stimulants, which may be cross-contaminated with fentanyl and other potent opioids. They also cause death on their own from stroke, cardiovascular events. And the stimulants driving much of the increase, um, these stimulants are driving a lot of the increase in overdose among Black and Native Americans who are often trying to limit their exposure to fentanyl, ironically. So another irony, the current excess of Black and Brown deaths from street supplies of stimulants and fentanyl derive from what I call technologies of whiteness. So I'm going to make an argument for whiteness actually being the source of what is now an incredibly black and brown overdose calamity. Um, and while black and brown deaths are nothing new in the US, what makes the crisis of the past 30 years different in many people's minds is the way that there was a white identity of sufferers, at least in the beginning. So um, I'm going to approach race and health from an angle that's unusual in medicine by examining, okay, I'll leave this one up for a moment, by examining the mechanisms of whiteness. I'm gonna share what I've come to see as a case study of the hidden but active maintenance of whiteness, white exclusivity in medicine as the cause of what we often call in clinical circles, quote unquote, health disparities among quote unquote, underserved minorities, groups typically described in a passive manner as quote unquote, lacking access to care. So this is kind of a passive process. Um, and I argue that whiteness is central to our environment of profit, motives in health industries, commodification, the use of racial hierarchies to open and segment markets. It involves the mutual racialization of drugs and people. Drugs can be white, as in targeted to white people, and they can pharmaceutically enhance the whiteness of people whose privilege is in question because of stigmatizing diagnoses like addiction. So I first encountered, let's see what's next here. Okay, well, this was an era. If you look at the timeline, this is the era that I'm talking about. I first encountered office-based medication for opioid dependence, as we called it then in the late 1990s. Uh, I was a medical student working under a, an attending, a medical supervising um, professor who was running early clinical trials of buprenorphine, commercially known as Suboxone, as a treatment for opioid dependence. And I overheard con conversations in the clinic at the time 
uh, the teaching clinic about how this miracle drug was going to change the color, the culture, change the culture of medicine by redefining addiction as a chronic medical problem, a health condition and disease um, that was analogous, actually the same, the same in nature, a chronic disease, the same as asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. And that it should be treated in the same settings and primary care clinics and in the same way with long-term medical management as those other conditions. So this really caught my ear as an MD PhD student training in anthropology. I was thinking, hmm, what could that mean to change the culture of medicine? That's really intriguing as an anthropologist. And what would drive that change in the culture of medicine? So as it turns out, my professors in that clinic were absolutely right. In the course of my career, I've seen a profound change in the way that clinicians frame addiction. So my field of addiction treatment, you know, I chose to go into addiction psychiatry. And what I observed was a big swing from what had been a drug-free philosophy of treatment, that the goal was to get people off of all substances, since it depended on sub dependence on substances is the core problem, to a, a very different uh, concept of long-term management of chronic condition with opioids, for example. Um, and, you know, first-line treatment for addiction, maintenance with opioids. As I completed an addiction fellowship and I took a faculty position in psychiatry and an anthropology department, I also documented very big differences between buprenorphine patients on one hand and methadone patients by race and class. So in theory, both buprenorphine and methadone are opioids used for long-term maintenance of people with opioid addiction. Um, but they, those two medications, chemically very similar, vastly different worlds created by vastly different regulatory policies and images of what the problem is and the nature of the, treat, of, um, the patients involved. So what began as a study of the culture of medicine became a study of how the opioid crisis came to be seen as white. Ironically, at the same time that the racially targeted drug war policies of the past few decades led to a peak in mass incarceration among Black and Latinx Americans. So this, the peak happened in 2008, and it was the early 2000s that I was seeing all of this evolve with a biomedical approach to opioid dependence. Um, and of course, you all, we all know that we have achieved and sustained the highest incarceration rate in the world on the basis of that racialized law enforcement and sentencing. So while narcotics have been criminalized through association with marginalized racial groups for over a century, so here's, you know, um, Chinese opium dens in San Francisco, actually, you know, where uh, Chinese immigrants who um, were already really marginalized were further um, oppressed through these images that they were luring unsuspecting white women into sex slavery with their opium. And then, you know, cocaine crazed Negroes in the U.S. South who were attacking their supervisors on the docks and places of work. 1914, this is the imagery. Mexican marijuana madness by the 1930s when the anti-marijuana laws were enacted. Uh, so this is a very consistent pattern in our history of drug war policies that have a lot of popular support among white voters on the basis of these kinds of images of the threat of what is essentially a black and brown problem. What these images don't reveal is this parallel set of images and narratives about white narcotics. So there has long been this protected space of prescribed narcotics for um, affluent, white consumers, often women, if you think about who presents most often to doctors with especially pain complaints, uh, women uh, were disproportionately getting prescribed. Here, these, this is advertisements for barbiturates, later benzodiazepines, such as Valium, Mother's Little Helper. There's always been this parallel track of legal narcotics um, for affluent white clientele. Um, and so we rarely ask about how it is that a drug can assume whiteness within this pharmaceutical logic based on race. We pay a lot of attention on the black and brown drug 
worlds and not as much attention to these white drug worlds. Yet the process of pharmaceutical whiteness that's underlying this is at the core of the widely asked question of 2015 when this article came out about the decline in US white life expectancy. You know, for example, why did the life expectancy of white Americans suddenly fall in the two decades of the, the first two decades of the new millennium, and while the life expectancy of almost every other racial ethnic group, excluding Native Americans, uh, rose in that time period? And how did overdose become the primary immediate cause of death? So, you know, I keep pushing to go beyond the received wisdom that unemployed white Americans in the post industrial rust belt. Um, turn to opioids for solace, you know, the depths of despair concept. So that might be true, but it still begs the question of why opioids, why white Americans, at least in that period of time, and why in that period of time? And so I argue that that generation of opioids of the late 90s to early 2000s were designed to have racial, white racial identities, and that in our stratified healthcare and justice systems, the social technologies shaping opioid consumption reinforce racial inequalities while at the same time harming white Americans. And key to this story, let's see, I'm gonna get back to that in a moment. Key to the story is an unrecognized form of ethnic marketing that because it targets whites, works by not marking itself as racial. The story is in invisible by design and it was only through years of observation and interviews with key actors in this whole story that I was able to unravel the threats. So I've observed drug policy and addiction science meetings and clinical interactions um, over six, over a two decade period really, interviewed hundreds of addiction scientists, treatment advocates, pharmaceutical executives, policymakers, administrators, prescribers, and patients to really arrive at the story. And when I add to that my co-author's work in the policy spheres and histor historical record, there's a lot that went into really teasing out this whiteness story. And I'm gonna start where I started myself in this research with Suboxone, otherwise known as buprenorphine. It's easiest to see its racial identity by comparing it to its predecessor, methadone. And this is a bar graph from the first nationally representative study to compare buprenorphine and methadone patients by race and class. And so you see a definite pattern here. I did some mapping in New York City that substantiated the same pattern. And later my colleague, I discovered my colleague at at UCLA had mapped similar patterns in um, Los Angeles. And then this is a study that came out two decades after that, documenting that as recently as the late, tw the late 20 teens, this is a paper from 2019, that white Americans were three to four times as likely as black Americans who had opioid use disorder, to use their terminology, to get prescribed buprenorphine. Not only that, but the most common form of payment was out of pocket for quite, this is a medication that costs thousands of dollars a year to maintain. So this is out of pocket treatment, um, followed by commercial insurance and much lower down on the list, public insurance. So it tells you that the demographics really did not change very much over that 20 year period. So um, what we don't know from graphs like this is by what process did buprenorphine and methadone gain their racial identities? How did this happen? And for that, we have to go back in time. So I'm gonna take us back to 1965 with race riots burning through Harlem, Philadelphia, and Watts, Los Angeles. The unemployment rate for black Americans is twice that of white Americans. And organized crime gains control of Asian heroin imports and recruits a sales force from these desperate unemployed black and Latinx city uh, residents. Meanwhile, Rockefeller University metabolic researcher Vincent um, Dole, who thinks of heroin addiction as opiate receptor deficiency analogous to insulin deficiency in diabetes. So very on, early on, he was drawing that parallel between heroin addiction and diabetes. Um, he publishes findings with co-authors from the first clinical trial of methadone maintenance. So this is an article from 1965, Annals of Internal Medicine. The study subjects are African-American heroin inject injecting uh, men, and its outcomes of reduced criminal activity and increased employment at six months brings it national attention. By 1970, news of methadone as a pharmacological answer to urban heroin problem reaches President Nixon, 
who appoints pioneering methadone psychiatrist Jerome Jaffe as the nation's first drug czar. Nixon targets inner city black and Latinx uh, residents as well as returning Vietnam veterans with methadone, this major weapon in the war on drugs. And to prevent diversion and street sale of methadone, the DEA regulates methadone clinics directly, requiring daily observed dosing. That means a nurse or an employee sits there and actually watches the patient taking the methadone and regular urine testing, which often requires the same nurse or staff member to sit in the bathroom and watch someone pee into the cup. So it's a very kind of punitive arrangement, uh, criminalized kind of uh, um, environment in many of the clinics. Due to community resistance, the clinics are located in marginalized neighborhoods, uh, remote from other medical services. So there's a lot of nimbyism around where methadone clinics are placed. So it's not fully medicalized and this is an image of a methadone clinic to give you an idea from the 70s. So not really a fully medicalized approach. Let's fast forward to October 8, 2002. A new kind of opioid problem has developed following Purdue Pharma's aggressive marketing of OxyContin as quote unquote minimally addictive pain reliever. And most of the newly dependent people are white. Many of them are middle to upper income. The FDA has just approved the synthetic opiate buprenorphine commercially packaged with naloxone and sold as suboxone for maintenance treatment of opiate dependency in buprenorphine certified doctor's offices. So pharmacologically similar to methadone, as I mentioned, they're both opioids. Um, it blocks the opiate receptors in the brains of addicted patients and totally unlike methadone, buprenorphine can be prescribed monthly for use at home while methadone is still to this day restricted to these DEA regulated clinics with their directly observed dosing. So office-based buprenorphine represents a reversal of national policy. It's the first time since the 1914 Harrison Act that private doctors are permitted to use opioids to treat opioid dependence. And to accomplish this, the manufacturers of buprenorphine and the architects of buprenorphine policy, they had to sharply distinguish buprenorphine pharmacologically in the same drug class as methadone from methadone. So they had to distinguish it from methadone symbolically and spatially, meaning buprenorphine had to be whitened. And this is Mike. Um, this is an image from an internet ad for Suboxone. He's seated in his Ohio diner, flanked by American flags, as you can see from one of the, the photos. And he's talking about returning to coaching his son's baseball team and singing in his church choir after buprenorphine rescued him from a prescription opioid habit following a back injury at work. So this is a really different image of who is the opioid quote unquote addict. Um, and many of you are social scientists, so you know this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. You know, this is this image and everything that goes into, oops, I lost my. Is everything good? Okay. Um, that this is a lot, this is a, a lot of cultural work that has gone into this transformation. Um, and it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the whiteness of buprenorphine and how it was actively achieved using what I call social technology, specific social technology. So I'm going to give you my analysis, our analysis in the book Whiteout. Um, using this construct uh, that we call technologies of whiteness and the idea of these technologies of whiteness, social technologies of neuroscientific metaphors, policy and industry strategies that maintain racial boundaries around biomedical uses of opioids. And the scheme is informed by whiteness studies and it's a part of critical race theory. Um, and it proposes that, uh, let me go to whiteness studies. Okay, that number one, whiteness is a category of exclusion and therefore requires cultural and political maintenance of its boundaries. In other words, not any old person can stand before you and claim to be a white American and be credible in that. I don't think I could claim to be a white American. Um, so this is a construct that's exclusive and there are a lot of guardrails around who can claim it. Number two, white race is unmarked, you know, the assumed norm, rarely explicitly named. And I'll get to this in a, in a moment. There's been an exception that proves the rule over the past decade or so. Um, but 
in general, white American, if not given any other prompts in a news story, someone's mentioned to be an American, most American residents will think that that person is white. It's the assumed norm in our country. Um, so the coverage of whiteness in presidential politics, as well as the coverage of white opioid deaths, have been the exception that proved the rule. And I also did some, some media content analysis analyses, finding that when white race is signaled, even in these areas, usually white isn't mentioned in, as a descriptor. They're coded words, such as suburban, that are used, um, as well as visual imagery. Um, while the race of the the race of Black or Latinx people with substance use issues in these articles is almost always explicitly named, most often in relation to crime. Okay, and then I skipped over one thing. Um, whiteness is defined by its other. It's a relative term. It's really a power relationship, right? So the person in power has whiteness, and the person without does not. So it needs something that's not white, black or other, to become white as a marker. Um, and punitive American drug policy has long had a mutually defining, mutually defining twin of legal narcotics for white Americans with access to personal doctors, as I mentioned before. Uh, starting with morphine and over-the-counter heroin for Victorian housewives, then moving to post-war white with barbiturates, stimulant diet pills, Valium, you know, the suburban mother's little helper, and now back to prescription opioid pain relievers. And then lastly, white privilege has its costs. So not, so not only did white consumers pay inflated prices for patented prescription opioids that they paid with their lives in the form of overdose by lethal substances to which they had quote unquote privileged access. So, you know, it, it is lethal to white people as well. And then I'm gonna run through a rubric of technologies of whiteness that we flesh out in the book. I'm gonna start with the least visible technology of race making, and that is brain science. We have to place buprenorphine on the backdrop of President Bush, the first decade of the brain. And this was an era in which NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, was directed to look for neuromolecular bases for addiction in anticipation of breakthroughs from the Human Genome Project. So this was a, a moment of you know, anticipated enormous profits from bi biologizing everything and finding the molecular basis for everything so that it could be um, addressed with smart drugs that are patentable. That was the, the environment. And in the process, National Institute on Drug Abuse renamed addiction a chronic relapsing brain disease, quote unquote. And this was supported by leading NIDA researchers who co-authored this widely cited article in the Journal of American Medical Association in the year 2000. And in it, they argued that narcotics dependence was comparable to diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. So this is a recurrent theme in terms of its heritability, treatment rate, adherence, and relapse rate. And as such, it should be treated as a chronic medical illness. And the scientists involved in this movement had a clear social justice intent. Now, they wanted to destigmatize addiction by demonstrating that it's a legitimate biological condition and not a problem of morality or choice. What they didn't anticipate, though, was that scientific universalism, uh, because it implied a standard white male subject, would help to open new markets to opioids white markets to new opioids, and that the unequal ways that biotechnologies are disseminated would enhance the social stratification of addiction. So this is an example of what I mean. Brain images like this, by taking the subject and his or her trappings of gender, race, and class out of the picture altogether, um, by taking the offending organ out of the body, the brain, um, you know, you look at this image, you have no idea who this person is, where they come from, what's their background, what's the neighborhood surrounding them, anything. Um, this image conveys an unmarked universality of addiction physiology, and neuroscientists further reduced causation in this era of the Human Genome Project and then the decade of the brain. Uh, they further reduced causation to molecular action at neuroreceptors, which is the ultimate disembodiment of addiction. So, you know, it doesn't really matter who you are, where you are, what you've experienced. It really boils down to a set of molecules that can be sequenced and uh, pat addressed with a patented other set of molecules in the commercial market. The apparent universality of this molecular model assumed a white norm 
It takes a problem long associated with black and brown crime and gives it a new implicit association with white subjects. And in the process though, it excludes social conditions. So the scientists involved wanted to counteract a drug war mentality by erasing the social context of drug use, but they paradoxically set the stage for renewed racial stratification of opioids. So this is what I mean, the second technology of whiteness, new biotechnologies. So these neuroscientists that I just described unwittingly, for the most part, aided corporate strategists that capitalized on this erasure of the social. So building on the neuroscientist ideology of technological solutions for addiction, in 1996, Purdue Pharma got FDA approval for OxyContin as a quote unquote minimally addictive pain reliever suitable for chronic management of moderate pain. And this was based on its sustained release capsule formulation. So the idea is that the oxycodone, the opioid inside, would only be released at a very slow rate through a tiny hole in the capsule, and therefore the user wouldn't get a rush to the brain of a high concentration of opioid. Um, and of course, what they left out of that was the social inventiveness of drug use on the ground. So the moment the Oxycontin capsules hit the market, people who wanted that rush just simply crushed the capsule and snorted or injected the contents. Um, the manufacturer at the time of developing Oxycontin, so this is an image of the pills, um, the manufacturer influenced the National Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation and to call for pain to be aggressively monitored and treated as the quote unquote fifth vital sign along with heart rate, respiratory rate, um, and blood pressure. And drug reps advised new opioid prescribers to direct OxyContin to quote, quote unquote trustworthy patients. Let's see if I have an image. I have an image later of, the, of this kind of advertising. But these were images of white people, largely the kind of white people that were thought not to be at risk of addiction, grandmothers, suburban housewives, et cetera. Um, and so they, these new opioid prescribers were directed to look for trustworthy market patients, trustworthy patients, which signaled really white patients. Um, and the manufacturer did this in a clinical workforce that has long been shown to suspect non-white patients of quote unquote drug abuse. So this implied directing it to white patients. Of course, what the model of addiction proof biotechnology left out was that social inventiveness that I mentioned. And after of crushing those capsules, after steep increases in opioid non-medical use and overdose, public pressure mounted for intervention. And in 2011, just as the original patent on OxyContin ran out, Purdue Pharma introduced its tamper-resistant formulations, um, embedding oxycodone, the opioid, into polymers that convert tablets into gummies should users attempt to crush and dissolve them for injection, for example. So by keeping prices high and representing OxyContin as technologically sealed off from non-medical use, the manufacturer strove to, kept, to keep OxyContin symbolically ahead of urban black and brown street markets. Another biotechnology was, that was developed specifically in response to the white suburban and rural prescription opioid phenomenon is buprenorphine itself, combined with opioid antagonist naloxone and branded suboxone. So Rick Ben Kieser Pharma promoted this combination as a smart drug. Although buprenorphine is an opioid that actually has a big street market demand in other countries, um, and at this point, probably here as well, uh, the manufacturer argued that by combining, combining it with naloxone, uh, because naloxone is an opioid uh, antagonist, reversal agent, uh, that would prevent people from non-medical use, such as injection. You know, if you take suboxone, the combination pill under your drug, you only absorb the buprenorphine. If you inject it, you get also the opioid antagonist, the naloxone, and you go into withdrawal. So this was seen as... Um, you know, a smart drug intervention to prevent non-medical use. And buprenorphine also posed a lower risk of overdose deaths than, for example, methadone. Um, in the 1990s, the National Institute on Drug Abuse subsidized naboxone's manufacturer with $23 million to test it for use in addiction treatment and sharply distinguish it from methadone, lobbying Congress and the DEA to lower the abuse potential rating of suboxone from narcotic schedule two, which is where methadone and Oxycontin fall, to narcotic schedule three, 
alongside coating cough syrup and other what are considered to be lower risk of non-medical use medications. This is what made it possible to prescribe Suboxone in private doctor's offices. And the manufacturers also lobbied Congress to get Suboxone included under an orphan drug clause that was designed to promote pharmaceutical development for unprofitable diseases in low-income countries. So for example, malaria drugs would fall under this orphan drug clause. They managed to get Congress to designate it an orphan drug, meaning that the patent on this drug was protected through 2009. It's a drug that was developed in the beginning in the late 60s. So the company had exclusive rights and could charge what the market would bear for that. In a race and class stratified healthcare system like we have here in this country, access to generalist doctors is often limited to prescribers for a medication like this. It's often limited to those who can pay. Um, patented expensive technologies for private office delivery in themselves encode white race and middle class. Do both. All right, third technology of whiteness. Although by 2004 prescription drugs overtook heroin as the primary opioid of abuse in the US, the arrest rate for the illegal possession of opioids, prescription opioids, was one fourth the arrest rate for heroin. An arrest for illegal, illegal sale of prescription drugs was less than one-fifth the arrest rate for selling heroin at a time in 2004 that, not coincidentally, the non-medical use of pain relievers was twice as high among white Americans as black Americans, while rates of heroin use among black, Latinx, and white Americans were almost identical. Since suburban and rural white opioid users were not politically popular targets, for drug law enforcement, at least suburban uh, white opioid users were not, the DEA and other regulators focused their surveillance and enforcement on prescription opioid prescribers and pharmacists instead. And one sign of that was the spread of these prescription drug monitoring programs that spread eventually to all states, half of which mandated prescriber participation in this uh, database where, you know, if you failed to check to see if the patient in front of you had been prescribed narcotics by another prescriber, you're subject to often loss of license, even pr criminal prosecution. So this was an unprecedented regulation uh, of prescribers. And believe me, it generated a lot of pushback from the American Medical Association, other professional medical associations. Returning to buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, the Drug Addiction Treatment Act that was passed by Congress in 2000, it was called Data 2000, enabled any certified physician to um, prescribe Suboxone, otherwise known as buprenorphine, in the privacy of their own offices. And in congressional debates leading to the passage of Data 2000, there was a clear emphasis on a quote unquote new kind of user, one that is young, suburban, and quote, not hardcore. So this was coded language for white. Recorded testimony from federal officials stressed that buprenorphine was uniquely appropriate for a new kind of opioid user as opposed to methadone, quote, which tends to concentrate in urban areas is a, and is a poor fit for the suburban spread of narcotic addiction, end of quote. So this is the kind of debate that was going on in, in Congress. Then Health and Human Services Director Donna Shalala was but one of many officials who testified in these hearings that buprenorphine as an alternative to methadone would serve a quote, new kind of addict, including citizens who would not normally be associated with the term addiction, end of quote. So with this racially coded language in which suburban and new kind of addict referred to middle-class white Americans, Data 2000 passed Congress and reversed 80 years of federal prohibition of private physician opioid maintenance for people with opioid dependence. So Data 2000 kept the restrictive methadone system that was introduced by Nixon intact. It did nothing to alter the drug laws that mandated inner city heroin users to prison, but it created this new treatment track for people who could afford it. And to give additional assurance to the DEA that buprenorphine wouldn't spill over into black and brown uh, illegal markets, buprenorphine's manufacturer, along with the, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, developed an eight hour certification course for um, doctors and later nurse practitioners who wanted to prescribe buprenorphine. So this is the first and only time that a drug has come along with this additional certification requirement. Very you know, unprecedented in the history of American medicine. 
So in my studies in the early 2000s to, to teens, public sector doctors that I interviewed explained that the certification requirement was a major barrier to making buprenorphine available to low-income people because public clinics did not provide any kind of incentive for carving out eight hours of time to get this training. They already had a full, a full caseload of patients over full, you know, and they really did not have any motivation to seek out additional patients, often who had complex needs, by getting certified through additional training. On the other hand, prescribers in the private sector were able to charge induction fees of up to $1,000 for an initial half-hour visit for buprenorphine. That was the going rate in New York at the time. So the shortage of public sector prescribers, along with the cost of the medication itself, long kept buprenorphine in the private sector. Okay, so the last technology is technology of whiteness, um, which is ethnic marketing and media. Oxycontin's legendary commercial success hinged on its designation as quote unquote, quote unquote minimally addictive. And while Oxycontin was under review at the FDA, Purdue estimated the addictive potential of Oxycontin to be less than 1% based on testing among terminally ill cancer patients for a three month period. So in, the, in 1996, the FDA, which by the way had been greatly weakened and the regulations around FDA um, committee membership had been greatly weakened, strengthening the tie to industry. In 96, the FDA accepted this claim and enabled Purdue Pharma to open an opioid market that had previously been restricted only to those with severe acute pain, you know, cancer pain with really deep bone, pa cancer patients with deep bone pain, post-surgical patients. That was the kind of patient who had gotten this type of opioid before. And what they were able to do, this was, uh, this was a Prozac moment for opioids in that what they were able to do was to market directly to primary care providers who had not had experience with this kind of opioid before, but the argument that this is something that could be prescribed for moderate back pain, or the kinds of pain that general doctors, primary care doctors often treat. They targeted a, um, a call list of over 100,000 physicians with over 700 drug reps in the first few years. And they targeted areas of the country white suburban and also rural areas serving patients that the public and the DEA didn't think of as at high risk for addiction. So Purdue's strategy was very successful. It led to a 10, oh, and this is the ad that I promised. This is an example of the kind of advertising. I just wanted you to get a visual for the, the type of patient that was seen as trustworthy and appropriate for these opioids. Um, so this was very successful. It led to a tenfold increase in prescription opioids nationally. It's 10 times as many opioids being prescribed as before with disproportionate, and by the way, not just Purdue Pharma and Oxycontin, there were sister products that came out shortly after. There was disproportionate uptake of Oxycontin by prescribers in white suburban and rural areas of states like Maine, Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia. One side note that I should mention is that workers comp often would cover this medication, and that's one reason why white rural residents were targeted um, as a market, because in areas where people did construction work and mining work and often had injuries and had workers' comp, this was also a prime uh, market where there was a, an insurer that would pay for it. So we saw disproportionate uptake in, in white uh, suburban and rural areas, Maine, Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and in a newspaper content analysis that I did with Jules Netherland, I found that in contrast to articles about the criminality of Black and Latinx drug users, suburbanites addicted to OxyContin were portrayed sympathetically in the media as people who were struggling with either physical pain or emotional pain. Ironically, Purdue's technological response to the first wave of white prescription opioid deaths, their tamper-resistant formulations of oxycodone, combined with the new prescription drug monitoring programs that I just described, led many of these people who are using prescription opioids to look for heroin when pills became harder to get. And one consequence of this was a whitening of the media coverage of who was a heroin user. Uh, and this heroin users had long been portrayed as black or brown. So this is a school teacher in suburban New York. This is a college athlete in Arizona. These are two of myriad images that came out around this time. 
And the targeted intervention for these new heroin users, buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, was marketed to middle-class insured patients over the internet um, using websites like this. This is the National Association for Buprenorphine Advocates of Buprenorphine Treatment. It's sponsored by Reckitt Van Kieser Pharma. And you know, I'll invite you to read the race, race and class coding of this website. And I showed you Mike's story, which is also located on this website. But if you look in the lower right-hand corner, patients find a buprenorphine physician. What they developed was a system where internet browsers could put in their zip code and get a readout of prescribers, certified prescribers in their area, the vast majority of whom are going to be in private practice. So um, this was a marketing innovation that was highly successful. It carved out an exclusive but quite lucrative corner of the market. So by 2012, there was over a billion and a half in sales in the US alone of buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone. In that year, 2012, it came in second only to OxyContin itself, which sold $3 billion worth. So in conclusion, I really wanna hear from you, so I'll try to wrap up. This racial segmentation of drug markets into licit and illicit, white and black, clinical and recreational, it creates a moving target of time-bound patents on new technologies that target, target the white middle class, which is the primary consumer for these expensive, newly patented products. Um, and it's a very old cycle. So it started with Bayer's own heroin. So Bayer, maker of Bufford aspirin, in 1898 released heroin marketed to housewives, white Victorian housewives, primarily as a cough syrup but overall as a non-addictive alternative to morphine at a time when a lot of Victorian housewives were getting morphine injections for lower back pain and menstrual cramps, things like that. So this is a very old story. What can we learn from this as clinic, clinicians, researchers, social scientists, policy advocates? Um, first, I want to argue that magic bullets are a myth, which is not going to be a surprise to any of you. It is a surprise to many of my clinical audiences um, because we still believe in magic bullets in psychiatry, believe you me. Right now, psychedelics are the magic bullet of the day and we'll move on to another one you know, in a year. Um, as the failed promises of OxyContin sustained release capsules show. And of the, in, the inability of unilateral, like a singular focus on buprenorphine as the answer. As these things have shown, the failure of these things has shown, biotechnology can't stop the harms of narcotics without systemic and social intervention. And this is an argument that, um, that I keep making with my clinical colleagues that, oh, so actually before I, before I get into that, I wanna, I wanna give a, a counter example. So my colleagues in addiction medicine in the U.S. often point to, the, to France as a country that has demonstrated the incredible power of buprenorphine to reduce overdose deaths, okay? And so they frame this as this miracle drug that has shown its powers in the country of France, which introduced primary care-based buprenorphine uh, in 1995. And here's a graph that showed what happened so one version of the story is that you can see 1995, the, um, the red curve is buprenorphine prescriptions. The blue curve that goes down is overdose death rates. So within the first five years, an 80% reduction in overdose death rates. So this is what my American colleagues point to reliably. The problem is if you're gonna compare France and the US, you have to take into consider quite a few other things. Okay, just a simple thing. There's universal healthcare in France. So if you're gonna have a primary care based approach to treating addiction and preventing overdoses, you better have access to doctors, which we don't have in this, this country. But even beyond that, as I work with my colleague, Marie Joffret Racide at Inserm Paris, which is kind of the NIH equivalent in, in France, um, what I've discovered is that the way buprenorphine is used in France is so different than here. They have developed a set of community-based addiction centers that are very multidisciplinary, multi-service, and comprehensive. So if you go to one of these centers, you're going to have access to buprenorphine and increasingly methadone, but you're also going to have comprehensive healthcare. You're going to have a peer, you know, a peer navigator. You're going to have 
help with housing and employment. You know, it's a very comprehensive approach. Um, and so, you know, this curve we have not, we've seen with all of the marketing and all of the promotion of buprenorphine treatment that's gone into the US over the past couple of decades, we're still seeing rapid acceleration of overdose deaths. So clearly this formula isn't working here and our approach to buprenorphine is not working here. The other really fun fact, if we go back to this, it's not fun, I shouldn't put it that way, but if you see the overdose deaths in 1995 at 565, that actually is 565 overdose deaths in a country of 60 million people. Think about the overdose death rate in this country, that would be closer to 565,000. So they never in France really had a quote unquote overdose crisis of the proportions that we've ever seen. And one of the reasons is that Oxycontin and sister products were never marketed there. And the reason they were, they were never marketed, believe me, the manufacturers tried, but they have not only a universal healthcare system, but they have a lot of guardrails around the national uh, body that approves or disapproves new drugs to be used by their universal healthcare system. And so that review body, which cannot have any ties to industry, unlike our system, uh, did not see any therapeutic benefit to OxyContin and sister products. So that should tell us a lot. Um, And it should, of course, make us skeptical about the power of the market to protect people. <laughs> um, and here's a final shout out to my mentors, Bruce Link and Joe Phelan, and their social conditions was the fundamental causes of disease model. So one of the predictions of their theory is that in a society like ours with a lot of social inequalities, if you introduce a medical technology um, as a way of addressing those inequalities without addressing the social, inequalities, you're going to widen rather than narrow the health inequalities. And that's clearly what's happened with buprenorphine. We're seeing a widening rather than a narrowing, despite all the promises of pharma to solve all of our problems, including health inequalities with the next bi biotechnology. All right, so second take home point is that problem drug use is biosocial. So I argue with my addiction medicine colleagues all the time that we should re-examine what it means to call addiction a chronic brain disease. What does that mean? So basic neuroscientists are increasingly seeing the brain as this plastic, socially responsive organ that has evolved over the millennia to adapt to complex social systems. That's the way we're put together. And emerging life science models of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, and the microbiome have underscored that human biology is not a fixed thing. Um, it's dynamically shaped in interaction with the environment, especially the social environment. So these more sophisticated biological models that are, by the way, much more sophisticated than what most doctors are trained in or understand, um, they inherently call on us to look at the, bio, the social part of that biosocial interface and to invest on research on the impact of social systems and interventions that create healthy social contexts, including, for example, robust social services and recovery support networks that give dignity, meaning, and structure to people's lives. So if we were to take seriously the comparison of drug dependence with diabetes, asthma, and hypertension, as my addiction medicine colleagues have over and over again, we would recognize that each of these conditions has strong social determinants and structural determinants, structural drivers of their own, and that success, any of you who've ever tried to help someone with diabetes, asthma, or hypertension, you know we have to address fresh food, safe, unpolluted, walkable neighborhoods, you know, housing conditions, the list goes on. All right, then the last take home, deaths of despair. They actually call for racial as well as economic justice. So um, some of you may have delved into Anne Case and Angus Deaton's um, formulation of deaths of despair. And their 2015 report um, was about the decline in US white life expectancy was a shocker. Um, not only because of the findings, um, it's interesting to note that the authors were not epidemiologists at all, they were economists. So their analysis of the root cause of the overdose, suicide, and sort of alcohol-related uh, liver disease um, that, that really explained the uh, decrease in life expectancy, their analysis of root causes had to do with not neuroreceptors or genetics, but 
the industrialization of American Rust Belt towns where departure of manufacturing and mining industries left behind high unemployment rates and social disintegration. So that's the deaths of despair analysis. And a sociological study that followed closely after this article of 2015 was this one conducted by sociologists that showed that there was this tight correlation between overdose death rates if you did a geographical analysis and the thinness of social networks. So um, this was also further evidence for quote unquote deaths of despair, that people were bowling alone, socially isolated. So this argument is persuasive in that it calls for social and economic revitalization through policies that promote social integration, stable employment, livable wages and benefits, and not just public-private partnerships to find the next patentable and saleable biotechnology or pharma, which is where the majority of our federal opioid response dollars have gone. They've gone into these public-private partnerships to develop new drugs and biotech. Um, but Case and Deaton's focus on white Americans makes the analysis incomplete, and it makes Black and Latinx overdose deaths invisible. So Case and Deaton didn't have a clear explanation of why Black and Latinx life expectancy did not decline in the time period of their study. And to this day, they don't really respond well to that question. But I want to posit that Black and Latinx Americans saw an overdose crisis 30 to 40 years prior to their white counterparts. Um, and that their white counterparts were protected by industrial racial discrimination, meaning black and brown laborers didn't have access to labor unions, they were the last hired for first fired, and they experienced those deaths of despair conditions of the industrialization in their neighborhoods much earlier. Um, and we know the story that black and, and Latinx opioid deaths um, in that heroin crisis of the 60s and 70s. Uh, those deaths were not seen as a part of a health crisis. They were seen as an epidemic of crime, you know, a symptom of an epidemic of crime and led to white flight from those center city areas, further disinvestment from those neighborhoods and a reduction of the tax basis there. Um, and we now are seeing uh, in part the survivors of those earlier crises. Um, so I mentioned the intersection with mass incarceration and the really high risk uh, after incarceration for overdose deaths. That's one of the engines driving the patterns that we're seeing now. While we work towards race and class justice in economic policy, we should use concern. And I'm gonna go through this very quickly because there are people in the room who can give a much more comprehensive set of analyses and recommendations here. But as a, and on principle, we have to look at number one, this is, where I start because I talk to a lot of clinical audiences, the Universal Health Conference of Healthcare. So the healthcare should, should include community-based preventive healthcare, right? And trauma-informed treatments. Um, attention to psychiatric comorbidity. Since I talked to a lot of psychiatrists about why they should care about this, we have not paid attention to all of the other emotional and mental struggles that people have. Um, Peer navigation, recovery support networks, assistance with housing and employment, the list goes on of what we could be doing if we were to pay attention to um, structural drivers within our healthcare system, structural drivers as health outcomes. Second, we should not be incarcerating people um, and we should be decriminalizing drugs and promoting treatment as well as harm reduction, importantly, as national responses to opioids alongside all of the social and economic interventions that I've been alluding to. So why do I have nationally at the beginning of this sentence? I want to give you an example from a program in Staten Island. So Staten Island in New York City is the city's wealthiest borough. It's also the whitest borough of all of the New York City boroughs. Um, it was the borough where this Project HOPE model was first developed and, and implemented. It was a collaborative project between the DA, uh, the district attorney for Staten Island, and a group of community organizers who were affected by the opioid crisis there. And what Project HOPE did, has done, and continues to do, it's done this since um, 2014. It takes people who have low-level drug charges and diverts them from sentencing. It provides treatment and a peer navigator. And they've done this for over half of those people who are arrested on 
uh, low-level drug charges um, throughout the program. The problem is that Project Hope to this day is largely confined to Staten Island. Uh, it is not happening in the South Bronx, which now reports the largest number of overdose death rates and where mass incarceration continues unbated as a major risk factor for overdose death. So as long as we leave it up to local groups of concerned citizens to do this kind of work, we're going to see the predictable results, that it's going to be the empowered communities, the white and affluent communities that get decriminalized. And then lastly, um, a pitch for biosocial and um, systemic research and interventions, which won't be a surprise to any of you, but it's surprisingly still hard to make this case in clinical circles. And what do I mean by this? For example, peer-based recovery networks involving the arts, urban gardening, community-based organizations, including spiritual and religious organizations. I want to shout out to Ayana Jordan, who some of you might know, the addiction psychiatrist who's placed addiction treatment, recovery support, and harm reduction in Black and Latinx churches and has demonstrated really good outcomes. So these are the kinds of approaches that necessarily integrate medicines with re recovery support networks, uh, harm reduction, and social services by trusted community members and peers. I'm gonna end there with um, you know, just the need to move towards an approach that reduces harm to both white and non-white um, U.S. residents of and beyond of our racialized drug industries. I want to hear from you. Yeah, so for example, all of the great ethnographies and social studies of sickle cell patients who endure just incredible pain and rarely get pain medication as a part of their, their treatment plan. So yeah, that's really great illustration of these two tracks. Um, and one question I wonder if I could put to the group is this argument of this kind of racial tracking and um, racial capitalism really uh, within our healthcare system being harmful to white Americans. You know, that's that's kind of that's a an argument that I see being made in other areas outside of healthcare as well. That there's something that is toxic to white people about the way that our economies and our systems are racialized. And I wonder if you've seen any success or any failures or risks with that strategy, because that's something that has been kind of the leading foot for me in um, how could we make use of this kind of great point and making me think about the conversations I've had with my co-authors, both of who are identified by others as white, <laughs> identify as white. And we you know each of us took the time to explore our own whiteness in the book. It was for me the first time that I'd really thought carefully and gone public about my white identity. Even though I don't count as a white American, you know, clearly I have ancestors that are white, you know, <laughs> and so in when I am near my relatives who are dark skinned, I'm the one that can kind of claim the white privilege. And so in the book, I go into that, you know, this concept of whiteness as a relative thing and a, as a part of the system. It's not a static quality in hearing in a person. It's a part of the system. So you're more or less white relative to other people and in a context. Um, and then my co-authors did a lot of soul, search, soul searching and reflection about their whiteness, especially with their um, fears around what, we ju what you just described, that in delving deeply into whiteness, they were again centering and privileging whiteness and themselves, their own stories of whiteness, um, you know, with Jules Netherland being afraid to put that into the book, her story of her own whiteness. She felt that that was reinforcing white supremacy in the end, she, she put it in because I encouraged her and said, there aren't enough white people who delve into this and do the self-exploration and then share it with other white people so that they can do the same. Um, and I think that that's earlier when we I was having breakfast with a group of people in this audience earlier and we I got a really good question about how did you end up working with your co-authors and what difference did that make? And you know, one thing that has been really rewarding about working with my co-authors is that between the three of us, we've been able to delve into whiteness on a personal level 
as well as you know as a part of our story um, in a really productive way because we come into this in, from very different places. We have a question from Seth Holmes who asked if you would talk about the related films that you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> that I've been working on for two decades, <laughs> even longer than this. But thank you, Seth, for that question. And I just want to thank Seth, too, for the opportunity to be here and just for all of the support that he's given me through the years. I wish he was here with us. Um, so he knows that I have been so struggling to do what I consider a final version of a film that I started with a therapy group at Bellevue Hospital in the addiction clinic there. So I was really lucky to train in addiction psychiatry in a clinic at Bellevue, New York City's largest public hospital. It was run by a psychiatrist who was a, an accomplished visual artist and kind of a rebellious psychiatrist. And what she did with that clinic was to create a sobriety garden <laughs> where patients and staff alike would cultivate, plant, cultivate, harvest, and you know, cook and eat together the products of a fairly large garden right next to the FDR um, highway. Uh, and also the arts were integrated into everything, lots of art groups, a kitchen was in the middle of the clinic so that people prepared meals together in between groups and therapy sessions. So this was a really unusual setting for me to train in addiction psychiatry. And I became one of the three co-leaders of um, what was called the Video Stories and Recovery Group. So this was a therapy group that was founded by an art therapist and a former patient who was a filmmaker. And we made films together. And in the course of making films, not only did people tell their own stories and make up stories and you know do casting and costuming and sets, they learned to use cameras. I learned to use camera along with them. To, they learned to create um, the backdrop for, for shoots, to do storyboarding, to edit. And so we made a film basically about the story. And I was able, in this brief window where I could identify myself as an addiction psychiatrist and an early adopter of youth and orphan treatment, I was able to get interviews with the founding C CEO of Reckitt Beats Ben Kieser Pharmaceuticals and a lot of kind of the major figures that play a role in the story that I told, like, um, for example, Jerome Jaffe, whose son was on the faculty of my department at the time. So I was able to get an interview with him. And, to, and it might have been a little disingenuous because I knew I had a critical edge, but I told them, I'm an addiction psychiatrist and I want to know this story. And um, so with this team of people who are in treatment for addiction, some of them on buprenorphine treatment, I was able to get this footage and we were able to edit together. And I still have a film that is not quite finished. And in the course of it, this is the sad part, in the course of it, two of the three people featured in the film have died. So that's that's the really hard part of it. And I think maybe a part of my not having turned back to it to just finish it. Um, so we showed a rough cut at the American Psychiatric Association. I think I showed a very, very rough cut here many, many years ago. And um, it's come a long way, but it's not quite done. It's one of those things that, one day, <laughs> but the process of doing it, whoa, taught me a whole lot. Thanks for that question, Seth. Um, I, you know, I really appreciate about your work that you operate both at the conceptual theoretical level and at the practical level. And I guess, thank you. As somebody also trying to actually do work in the world, um, I find myself coming to a precipice of these analysis and having to try and figure out what this can be. Yeah, what do you do with that? What do you do yeah. With that? Well, on a cultural level, what do you do with that? On a personal level, what do you do with that? In a way, for lack of time, do you have a question? Sure, so I'll try to make it real short because I know where it's been. So, uh, just a, a quick shout out to our life science colleagues because I found the life sciences scientists much more receptive to this concept than clinicians and physicians in particular. I think that doctors are anxious about their scientific base. They kind of, you know, they know that there's something missing because it's not as though they're on the front lines of really understanding 
the scientific basis of many of the journal articles they read on new treatments and so forth. So it turns out the life scientists, many of them, you know, there's an evolving social neuroscience field. Um, it hasn't taken off in the US like it's taken off in Europe and other places, but um, the idea of neuroplasticity, microbiome, um, epigenetics, these are the hot and exciting frontiers and life scientists are increasingly interested in that social part of it. And I, when I was still at NYU, we formed this biosocial research network that we called Symbioses, where we brought social scientists and life scientists together to look at case studies where we could actually come up with projects. And then when I moved here to UCLA, to California, to UCLA, I was able to find some other like-minded life scientists. And we, we recently got a $5 million grant from the Dana Foundation to create a neuroscience and society center that, would, um, that will develop a community participatory neuroscience, meaning laboratory neuroscientists will go into South LA, East LA, parts of LA where residents typically don't participate in crafting the neuroscience agenda. And we, we're gonna work with community organizations there with Charles Drew University, uh, historically black medical school, and now uh, Hispanic Serving Institute Medical School, Institution Medical School. We're gonna partner with them to not only have lab scientists go there to co-design mm -hmm. neuroscience research studies, but also bring interested community residents into the laboratory, into neuroscience research labs. Our first pilot project was on the impact of low altitude helicopter noise, law enforcement helicopter noise on sleep, because South LA is a place where there are lots of law enforcement helicopters early in the morning, late at night, circling at low altitudes over specific housing projects. And the residents of those neighborhoods said to us, this is a problem that really we really want to look into and then we were able to our, our neuroscience colleagues were able to bring this into the lab and model the impact on rodents and eventually fruit flies because the community residents themselves said we want to know the heritability like the epigenetic they didn't use that term they used historical trauma and words like that but we want to know the impact over the generations so one of our neuroscientists began plugging in ear pods into the test tubes of um, fruit flies and looking because they reproduce so quickly looking at the intergenerational effect so that's the kind of research that we're trying to get off the ground I've been speaking with Osagi about could we revive the symbiosis by social research network with a west coast branch and branch to the east coast version because I think this is the future you know I think that our life science colleagues many of them understand just what you said everything biological is actually social. Even, even if you look at non-human organisms, it's social. Biology is a social system. So thank you for that. And on this radical call for more social sciences and, and medicine. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank for you. Wonderful. Thank you.